I'm Lisa. Um, I'm from Pro Writing Aid, and with us today is Orna Ross, who I'm sure many of you already know from her work with the Alliance of Independent Authors. Um, Orna is a novelist, a poet, a proud indie author, and she's also a huge advocate of self-publishing as artistic expression, and also as a viable business option for authors. Um, and her work for the Alliance has seen her named one of the most one of the 100 most influential people in publishing by the bookseller, which is not bad. So welcome, Orna. Thanks for being here. Hi, Lisa. Lovely to Hi. be here. Thanks for inviting me along. No problem. Thanks for coming and sharing with us. We've had so many really great partners who have just come and shared all of their insight, and it's been really amazing. So tonight, you're going to talk us through the seven processes of publishing. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I know that a lot of people listening will be familiar with uh, these processes, have already lived through them, and perhaps have, you know, some people are possibly on their first book. I'm sure we have some first book people in the audience, and we may well have somebody who's on their 15th book or their 50th book. I, I don't know. But I think it's always useful to revisit these seven processes and to understand, you know, I hear people talking about still about, you know, are you published? And, you know, what they mean is, did somebody in London or Manhattan say, yes, you're good enough for us to invest in your book? But that's not what publishing is at all. Yeah. Publishing is these seven processes that you have to get right in order to, to turn around and say, I'm a good publisher. I'm actually good at the job of publishing. And um, so that's what I'm going to talk through tonight. And just a quick kind of whiz through what the seven are, and then we'll kind of go back and take one at a time, which is exactly what you have to do as an author is know what the seven are, but stay where you are through each one of them. And don't worry about the next one until you've got, you know, uh, uh, things sorted with the earlier okay. stuff. So, um, okay, so that sounds good. So we've only got an, we've only got an hour. So what yeah. Orna and I were saying is she's going to go through each of the seven. And then after each one, um, we'll take a couple of questions. But um, as, as Ona was saying, it would be, you can make a whole session out of any of these seven on their own. So we're going to try and keep it to a bit of a minimum. We might not get to everyone's questions. So just to let you know in advance, um, we're going to try and be a bit snappy tonight. Yeah, great. And if people want to send in questions later, I'd be delighted to come back if, and, and Lisa will know the answer to those questions anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so just to say that the seven stages are, um, it begins with editorial, vital, so important. And, you know, it's something that I think a lot of new indies uh, want to skip or do skip and then learn. No, don't skip. Very important. So editorial, then design. Then production, putting the book together in three formats, ebook, print, and audio, and then um, distribution, how you kind of get it out there and make it available. Distribution in itself doesn't sell a book at all. It just, you know, it's just there and can be accessed. So the next one is marketing, which is all about your promise to the reader. And then promotion, which is not the same thing as marketing. And that's where I see a lot of people getting confused. And then the final one um, is rights licensing, um, which we probably won't spend so much time on tonight, but it is an important part and we'll, we'll touch on it. Sorry, I accidentally muted myself there. Okay, so do you want to go ahead and start with number one? Sure. So I spoke about there how important editorial is and um, it really is. I always kind of say choose an editor like you choose a spouse because it's a really, really important relationship and it takes time for a writer to find um, a good editor and also to understand what level of editor you need for a particular book. So in some books we need to do, there are three types of editorial and with some books we need to do all three. And sometimes we don't, sometimes it's a shorter book, a simpler book and just, you know, um, a, a proofread is, is all that is necessary. So the three types are developmental, which is where you work with somebody who helps you to structure the book. If it's, if it's fiction, making sure that you, you know, you've got everything in there that needs to be there, that you haven't overwritten one part and underwritten another, that the whole book hangs together, that the pacing is right, all of these kinds of things, which as you go on in your career, you get better at. But at, at the beginning of your career, there will be things that you're not good at. It could be dialogue, it could be voice, 
whatever it is, developmental editing is, is really kind of important. And um, then there is the copy editing, which is kind of at the paragraph um, level where you're looking, uh, the editor is looking for consistencies and style and overall feel of the, the sentences and, uh, and paragraphs that they hang together. And then there's proofreading, which is at the, um, the level of the line and the word. So, you know, we can automate a lot of this. Pro Writing Aid obviously helps hugely in, in part of this, but we still need uh, flesh and blood editors to work with us. And it really is, people ask me, what is the most important thing for marketing my book? I say editing. <laughs> Without a properly edited book, you're going nowhere really. Uh, yeah, it won't take your reader long to, to realize that you haven't edited your book properly if you don't put the yeah. time in. Yeah, well, and we get that a lot, you know, at Pro Writing Aid, people say, well, Pro Writing Aid is never going to take the place of a human editor. And of, of course it isn't. We absolutely agree. But, I mean, we just think that, if, that authors need to spend as much time as possible self-editing and getting it as far along as they possibly can. And then, yeah, they need an actual flesh and blood editor to come and help them see what you can't see anymore. Because once you're in your book, you're so deep into it that it's almost impossible to see the forest for the trees. I'm really glad you said that about self-editing, though, because I, I do think that is so vital. And, and um, you know, doing as much as you possibly can as the author and uh, before you give it to an editor means that you'll get much better value from your editor. If you haven't done the self-editing work, if you haven't used Pro Writing Aid, um, you know, if you haven't knocked all of those mistakes out, they're just going to spend the amount of money you pay them fixing up all that. However, if you've got all that in place, now they can really add value to your book. And the other thing is that self-editing and, and using tools like Pro Writing Aid really help to develop your skills. If you're handing that stuff off, you're not actually becoming a better writer for the next book. So yeah. um, self-editing is actually the most important aspect of, of editing. Yeah, I think so too, because you want your, your human editor to be able to really focus on the meat and on the stuff that, you know, a computer is never going to be able to help you find character inconsistencies or holes in your plot or anything like that. So that's where you want their focus to be. You don't want them to be fixing, you know, style mistakes or really basic writing errors. And yeah, like you say, so much of it is practice. The more you do, the more time you spend self-editing, the better you get at it. Absolutely. So shall I move to design or are there questions on the editing aspect or? Any questions on that or shall we move on? We'll all, we can come back to any of these things at the end. Sure. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead to the next. Okay, lovely. So then once you've got a, a fully edited manuscript, so it's been through your self-editing process and it's been through the developmental edit if it needed that. And as I say, at the beginning of your career, you probably do need it. And I, I think it's worth saying that you possibly need it all the way through. It is It does represent a big investment, but you know, Stephen King gets his three rounds of editing every time he puts out a book. So if he needs it, probably yeah, you need yeah. it. Um, exactly. Roger Federer has a has a tennis coach, even though he's the best in the world, he still has a coach that helps him and helps Excellent. him develop things. So yeah. Keeping that expertise um, going uh, helps your growth as a writer enormously. So yeah, once you've got that though, you've got this beautifully polished um, manuscript that's been through its developmental edit, its copy edit and its proofread. Now you're looking at design and, um, cover design is where where it starts so really superly important to get your cover right and again I believe very strongly in working with an expert there are areas where you can kind of cut corners um, as a self-publisher and we want to do that whenever we can but um, a professionally designed cover is really important and two aspects of it are are you know really kind of key the first is that it is compelling and attractive and that's much more important that a lot of authors get hung up on the cover reflecting exactly what's in their story or inside their book and that's not as important as that it induces in the reader the emotion that you want to have them to have about your book 
which is a very different thing. And that's something that, that book designers understand. And I would urge you not to use your local graphic designer or your cousin who's you know, a brilliant artist or whatever. Book design has certain elements in it that only book designers understand. So to work with a professional book designer, again, is an investment that will repay you again and again. And the second thing about the book cover is that it has to be genre specific. So if you can work with a designer who has worked on other books in your genre, take a look at what's at the top of the bestseller lists. Um, fashions in cover design change and and I have noticed as somebody who's been in this business a very long time um, I have noticed that they're changing much faster you know what's kind of current and selling books and making books move off the virtual shelves one year is not necessarily what's working the, the following year and there are definitely trends since readers have gotten much more involved in the buying you know the direct buying from writers and stuff you see that moving a lot faster so do look at what's selling right now in your genre and um and get somebody to to help you with your, your book cover design it should also be a thing of beauty for you i think that's really important one of the pains for me when i uh, was trade published when that was the only way you could be published and um, one of the pain points for me was covers that i didn't personally like um, mm. I can't, yeah it's really difficult to go out and kind of go here's my book I, you know if you yeah, the cover is something you can go i don't like it you know so and um, make sure that you don't fall into the traffic of commercial it does need to be commercial it does need to appeal to the reader but it also really need, you need to love it because you want to be able to get behind it yeah when we one of our earliest sessions was with nick stevenson and he was talking about one of his he writes thrillers and he tried three different covers and he, he showed us the numbers and the charts and everything. It was really interesting. And when he changed the title, I can't remember if it was from yellow, yeah, it was from yellow to red, his book sold 70% more or something because thrillers have red fonts on the cover. They don't have yellow. And so people weren't recognizing it in the same way. And it was only when he went to a professional book designer that that they understood that and they understood what is expected by readers in there. So I think it's really worth spending that time. And you know, a lot of us are, are words people rather than visual people. I mean, myself included. And so I think you need to know where, where your skills lie and what your aesthetic is and then find someone who is a visual person that can play in that world, I think. Yeah, I think so. And I, I do realize that I'm talking about a lot of investment here. And sometimes, especially when you're coming into this, you know, for the first time, you can feel like you don't want to or can't or can't find that money. But I, I would urge you when it comes to editorial and design, beg borrow, steal, you're, you know, this is a business you're, co you're coming into. And in terms of upfront investment for a business in, in relation to the amount of potential reward that is in your intellectual property, these are actually not big investments. And I say that fully knowing that that can be a lot of money for somebody at a particular point in time. But, you know, just to think of it in that way, I think is very important and to realize that it isn't a, a cost um, or an expense so much as an investment in money that's going to come back to you and to, to view it in that way is the business-like way to think about it. And I definitely see that authors who get that fundamental do better. Yeah, because it'll affect everything further down the funnel. All of your other processes will be affected if you don't get these ones right. Exactly. Okay, um, good. Let's go on to the next one, unless anyone has a quick question about design. Um, oh, Tony says Orwell's 1984 had several different covers since it was printed. 15 that changed in line with the trends and the periods and the countries that it was sold in. Absolutely. And I'm personally right in the middle of changing covers on books that I published back in 2013. Um, you mentioned color. I'm changing, not changing the design, but changing the colors because the colors, which really kind of sold then, um, look very dated now. And uh, so covers is something you come back to again and again and invest in and try and tweak a bit. And yeah, we'll talk about them a little bit more when we get into the process of, of marketing and promotion. 
Okay, could you speak really quickly um, about how, do you have any tips on helping people find the right cover designer? Um, well, we at, at the Alliance of Independent Authors, we have a bank of authors who are vetted and, oh, sorry, of designers who are vetted. And um, that is one option. If you're a member of Ally, you can take a look at our approved um, cover designers. But I think the thing to do with, and this applies to editorial advice, um, our editorial services as well, the thing to do is look at books that you admire, that are in your genre, that are targeted, very, very important, targeted to your niche, your audience. And then look at the acknowledgements, you know, most indie authors now are always kind of crediting the professionals that they worked with. It wasn't a habit in trade publishing, but when indie authors started to do it and how the trade has picked up on it as well. And a lot of the designers and editors that work in trade publishing also work with indies and sometimes indie authors are not aware of that. And they're now almost always freelancers who are very happy, love working with authors actually. So if you find a book that, you know, ticks all the right boxes, it's selling well, and you love the style, and then definitely have a conversation with that designer. Ask always what else they have designed. Take a look at the feel, look at the um, reviews of their work, which you can see in all sorts of places. If you see somebody that's worked with them, drop a line to that author and say, where are you happy with, with the working relationship? Are you still with them? If not, you know, why not? How has it gone? And also think about how you like to work with people. I think sometimes with indie authors, we're too inclined to go with the service comes and says, this is how I do it. And, da, 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 bum, bum, bum. and that's in their favor. Naturally, that's their business. You've got to be kind of clear, well, I like working in this sort of way. Da, 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 da. This is how I like it. And come to a negotiated agreement to businesses together rather than finding yourself on the back foot in a relationship with a, with a, a publishing professional. Yeah. Yeah. And I think everybody finds that relationship needs to find the person that works in the same way or in a way that's complementary with how they work. Um, Angela wants to know if you think the designer should read the book before they design it. No, you, you won't get that. Think about it. How could that person be in business? They would have to spend their week reading, not designing. Absolutely not. No, it will never happen. And, and again, this is something that indie authors get invested in. They really don't need to. And the person who writes your blurb, you know, nobody, no publishing professional involved with your book needs to read your book. They may choose to, fine if they do. And I would really think fine if they don't. It's good to kind of get to that place of equanimity about it, not to need them to do that. Because if they're going to be a good designer, you want them to be designing lots, not reading lots. So, yeah. um, but they will need from you the core components, you know, what's important, the kind of mood you want to evoke. They, the more you can help them and the best designers send, you know, they have a brief sheet. They will send out a whole load of questions that they will ask you to answer. From that sheet, they've got everything they need to give you exactly what you need. So, um, yeah. No, it's probably quite a good exercise for a lot of authors to be able to talk about that tone and exactly what they want it to be. It's it is. It's the beginning of, I think the editorial process begins at an end. The, the more you go into all these processes, the more you actually um, begin to separate from your book and look at it um, with a bit more of an objective eye because you have to answer these questions from publishing professionals. And again, beginning authors can sometimes be a bit touchy and they, it's all about, is my book good? Do you like it? And once you publish for a little while, it's not about, it, do you think my book is good? I don't care what you think. All I care about is my, re my reader. You know, it's very yeah, unlikely yeah, yeah. you are my target reader. And so actually, I don't care whether you like it or not. And uh, <laughs> it's good enough to put out there and for me to get on to the next one. So you become, you know, you become more detached. And the more detached you can be from your work, actually, the better publisher you are. If you're too much still wearing your writing hat, it interferes with your ability to be a good publisher. Um, but don't worry about it. It's not something you can pretend. If you feel, what, if you feel what you feel, it's just the act of putting out more books and having more dealings with more publishing professionals just develops your own professionalism as a publisher over time. Yeah, okay, good. Um, a couple of people are asking about interior design. Is that something yeah. that, do the same, will the same person do the cover as interior? 
not necessarily at all. Um, so in, interior design is, is for print books and it is a very specialist area. Uh, it's called high setting in the old days. And then the interior, the kind of digital interior of your ebook is formatted, which is a slightly different skill. So there are a couple of revolutionary tools in, in the marketplace, which I think actually can save you the price of a formatter. Um, apologies to all formatters out there, but um, for Mac users, um, Vellum is a terrific, mm -hmm. uh, everybody talks about it because it really is remarkable. And um, I am an absolute klutz when it comes to any sort of work uh, that needs attention to detail. I have memories of my father shouting at me my entire life, attention to detail. <laughs> so, you know, you need that for form formatting and which is why I thought I could never do my own formatting but I do format both my my um, ebooks and my print books in Vellum now okay. so it really is an exceptional um, tool now I know that there are other authors who say no I will use it for my ebooks but I actually want the tight set it kind of it gives you a pretty uniform output for your print book so if you want something different you you'll need to again hire somebody for that um, role. And yeah, and everyone, it's Vellum, V-E-L-L-U-M. I've just dropped it in the... Um, yeah, Vellum.io. It is think. only Mac, I'm afraid, and they are they stand by that. I don't think they're going to put out a Windows one no, anytime they're, soon. They're, they're but there are Mac. some other ones out there for if you're not a Mac user. Yes, there are various. Um, Scrivener is also good and, and covers all sorts of eventualities. And then you might just say again, no, I'm going to leave this one to the professionals. And again, I think it is something, while editorial, you've got to have an editor. And um, with, with um, cover design, I really think you absolutely have to. With formatting, with enough time, you can do it. You can get templates. Um, Thebookdesigner.com, Joel Friedlander. Um, I don't know if you if you're aware of Joel. He um, does these fantastic temp te templates that allow you to work from a Word document. Even um, and personally, I think Word is a curse, but um, he has has these templates, and a lot of writers swear by them. So there are ways in which you can, if you have the time to invest in it, you can. Um, this is one you can master yourself and can save some money on. However. I will sound the note of caution to say, really probably you'd be better getting the professional to do that while you go back in and write a book because that's really important in terms of your, you know, being a, an author publisher is a long-term endeavor. And the more product, the more books you can actually produce, the more chance you have of um, getting a return on your investment and going on to actually earn a living as, as an indie author. So again, I would feel that, you know, unless you love it, unless it's something, yeah, I really love playing with the text. I love creating this beautiful interior. It gives me great joy, but then absolutely go for it. But if it's an absolute headache for you and it's taking a huge amount of your time, you'd probably prefer to be writing so get someone else to do it. And then... Okay, um, good. We better, we better move along. I'm worried that we're going to run out of time here. Yes, yes. Okay. What's your next so, question? Where were we? Um, that was just design. Okay, yes, I see what you mean. <laughs> distribution, distribution has changed com completely for indie authors. So um, you can now get your books all over the world in ebook form and in print and demand form. So I'm going to talk about print first because that's the simplest. Um, print distribution, we recommend that you use Amazon for the, ecos the Amazon ecosystem. So that will be Amazon KDP Print, which used to be Create Space. You um, publish through Amazon for that, but you don't use Amazon for your what they call extended distribution or expanded distribution. You use Ingram Spark for that. And in Ingram, you deselect Amazon, and in Amazon, you deselect Ingram so that you're using both together. And this maximizes your distribution in print. It takes you to the most countries in the world because Amazon is only in. 13 countries Ingram is in 80 or something um, and uh, it also means that uh, it shows up uh, in Amazon correctly your your um, all of your your ebook and your standard print book if you do a hardback with Ingram you will see that it always has a little tag about it being out of stock or it's going to take you know three months or something to deliver and that's just the way Amazon handles Ingram Spark distributed books so that's why wherever you can to use Amazon for the Amazon ecosystem use Ingram for the rest 
and Ingram then makes your print book available so that any print, um, any print book seller the world over and, and librarians and you know all sorts of people can order your book without you ever seeing them do that without you ever touching that print book it's print on demand only printed when it's ordered it all takes place away from you but the uh, receiver of the book doesn't know any of that they just get the book as if you sent it out to them so it's okay, that's great really we've got we've actually got robin cutler who's the director of ingram spark doing a session with us in a couple of weeks so um Treat any of the questions around that come and we'll get as much information as we can out of her. She's going to tour us through um, the whole platform and help us get, a, get our heads around it. That's fantastic. And she's a wealth of knowledge on all aspects of book distribution. So that will be fantastic. So I won't waste any more time on that. Um, okay. e ebook distribution then, we recommend that you go directly. Oh, hang on one second. Oh, yeah. um, Nicola Cook is saying that you missed number three production. Product distri distribution. Oh, sorry. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but putting. Um, Thanks, <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, this is production, distribution, and production. Let's talk about them together, okay? okay. Because okay. You'll, you'll actually put the book together when you come onto Amazon to put your your print book together. You'll put your design. Your, uh, thank you, Nicola. You put your design cover and your designed interior will be brought together and produced as you upload it onto the platform. And I definitely should have, have made that clear. So um, that's in producing your, your print book. So production and distribution go hand in hand with, for digital publishing for indie authors using digital publishing methods, by which I mean your print book is POD, which is also a digital, people sometimes say digital books and they mean ebooks, but actually print on demand books are also digitally published, as are audiobooks now in the main, 95% of audio or something is now downloads rather than any other mm -hmm. method. So digital publishing covers all three. So in producing and distributing your print book, I think that's sorted. Um, Amazon KDP plus Ingram Spark together, you will, you will upload your files, you'll get your files from your designer or you'll produce them yourself and you will upload them. And in the uploading, you've both created the book. You will then get a proof copy, which you need to check carefully, very carefully to make sure that it, it looks and feels as it should. Get somebody else to read it as well at that point allow yourself enough time to do the proper level of checks that's print ebooks we recommend again you will make your ebook as you upload it um, and we recommend that authors should go directly to amazon and um, kdp and um, that covers again the amazon ecosystem which is the largest seller of ebooks in the world by quite quite a stretch mm -hmm. it is changing there are more people going wide and there are more people buying wide. And there are more people buying directly from authors on their own websites. And I would urge you to remember that you too are a platform when it comes to distribution. So make sure that you also have a transactional website where people, if they do come to your website, can actually buy your book on the website. You can't do that if you're exclusive to Amazon on their KDP Select program. So, but you can um, do it if you're not. So um, again, we would say maybe on your first book, you might want to do exclusive um, KDP, but in general, exclusivity is something to avoid in your distribution arrangements to, to be, you know, to go wide and be available in as many platforms as possible, in as many formats as possible is your general aim as an independent author. So direct to Amazon, ideally, again, depending on time, if you can go direct to Apple and Kobo and Nook um, as well and Google Play, you will then be published properly in ebook um, all over the world. Again, you'll have covered 90%, uh, 95% probably of all purchasers who, who purchase ebooks everywhere. Um, and then you use what's known as an aggregator for the rest. So aggregators are people like Smashwords, Draft to Digital, Publish Drive, um, Streetlib. They're all great aggregators. And what they do is they bring your book out to all sorts of places um, where those bigger players don't go, which is a growing part of as, as India and Africa and um, Southeast Asia, China, 
get involved in buying books in English, the, we're seeing global growth in the purchasing of ebooks here in a way that we're not seeing it in, in more mature markets like the US. So using an aggregator is an actual way into some of these markets. If you're short on time, you might want to only publish your ebooks through Amazon and an aggregator who will look after all the other platforms as well, but you will lose out probably on some promotional juice. The platforms like you to go direct and they like you to talk about um, you know, them as well as Amazon on your, in your website and so on. So that's a, a kind of a quiz through both production and distribution of ebooks. So you're producing the book as you upload the cover, as you upload the interior, the formatted work that you've done in the design phase. It, they're made as you kind of go through it. Audiobooks, similar. Um, ACX is the Amazon platform and it has had a direct link into Audible, which is the biggest seller of audiobooks in the world. Slight changes going on there with, um, I won't, don't have time to go into, but um, again, you use somebody like Authors Republic or um, Find Away Voices as an aggregator who will take you to the rest. So ACX offers an exclusive or non-exclusive deal. We would say go for the non-exclusive. The royalties are lower, but um, you then are free to use other services, which will take you out far wider. And though the money might be a little bit slower coming in, it offers you over time a much better prospect of a longer sustainable income. Okay, great. Um, a couple of people are saying, can you just mention the names of some of the aggregators again, just because... Um Certainly. Um, so Give us a list of your favorites. Uh, yeah, so these are the, these, these, Smashverse is the oldest aggregator and has been around the long, longest time um, and is based in North America. Draft to Digital um, came into the, the North American market then in 2013 and they do all sorts of things. You might be familiar with them. They do lots of other services for authors like books to read and so on. So um, that's Draft 2 with a 2. Mm -hmm. and the digit to digital yeah, and we did a session with them as well so i'll include yeah. a link to the recording um when i when i send out the email tomorrow if you want to have a look a, at that a one. fantastic service and um, you know yeah it is amazing very pro indie and uh, very pro author and they're really fantastic and um, then there's publish drive based in hungary also a wonderful service and publish drive is the only aggregator that does all three formats um, it does ebook print now and audio so that makes it a kind of a one-stop shop they also have an unusual payment method most of the aggregators work by taking a percentage of the percentage that you're getting from the services and um, publish drive offers that as well but they also offer a monthly you can pay a monthly fee and then you don't pay any of your royalties after that so that's depending on how many books you're actually selling that can be a good a good number as well and then Street Lip are really interesting, uh, based in Italy. They are, they are definitely the global um, eye. You know, they, are, um, they also run the new publishing standard, um, which is run by Mark Williams, who lives in Africa. And they have very much have a, a, you know, a, a pan-global view and will get your book into places that you've never heard of. So, um, so they're the four, Street Lib, um, like Street Library. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll include all of those in the email tomorrow too, so you can check them out. Good. All right, let's keep moving. And so production distribution and um, great. It's out there. Okay. You've done an incredible amount of work to get it here. Easy. You're exhausted. I know. <laughs> I know you are. But unfortunately, there is no, all of that work doesn't mean that you're going to sell a book really necessarily. You can have a great book, it can look great, it can have a great cover. You probably will dribble some sales just by being good. But the problem is everybody's so good. There are so many amazing books produced both by the trade and by indie authors now. You're in competition with a lot of great books. So you've got to be not just good, but great. But the key to this is that you actually begin to, to, to um, promote your book. But first, let's talk about marketing. So marketing is kind of your promise to the reader. Marketing is what lets your reader, your target reader know that A, you exist as an author and B, this particular book exists. 
So it's, it's a lot, marketing is a long-term repeatable sort of activities that go on and on and on. It includes your covers. It includes the blurb description that you write about your book, which is part of the production um, phase. It includes your author website and how it looks and feels. It includes your social media presence. Any ongoing activity that's constantly kind of being put out there that tells people you exist and your books exist, that's marketing. Promotion is time-based, um, a start and a finish sort of campaign energy put behind a particular book for a particular, um, a particular campaign, perhaps, on a particular platform, or it could be a price promotion, or it could be, it can be anything, but it, it, it is essentially, it has a start and a finish, and you know, uh, going into it, I want to, this to, particular promotion to shift this amount of copies, and I think that's a realistic prospect because I'm doing A, B, C, and D, so that should work. Promotion would be a campaign on Facebook advertising. You know, it can be anything. There are so many different ways, so many hundreds of ways you can promote a book. Um, and so it's important though to draw those two distinctions in your mind. So ongoing marketing is really important. It's kind of like the sub whisper about your book is constantly going out there, drip feed. And over time, people come to understand, oh yeah, that's the kind of author that is. I know then they sell, even if they don't buy your books, you know, a thriller writer or a nonfiction business book, or, you know, they just kind of know what you are and what you stand for. But a promotion will take you to new readers. It's deliberately designed to get you out there to people who haven't heard about you before and to push a particular book. Okay, great. Questions about that, anyone? It's so there's so many options with marketing. I think that's why people find it overwhelming. There's so many things that you can do and there's so many things that you can spend your money on. And it's, I think a lot of writers end up with a bit of um, paralysis because it's, yeah. it's just hard to know where to go. I think the main thing myself with marketing is to think of your own website as a kind of a hub where people can come and find out about you and to, if you, if you can blog or do a podcast or do something that brings people over to your own website and have that whole sign up mechanism that Nick, if you've had Nick on, you've gone through this whole thing, have that whole kind of gift for prospects thing where you you know give people something in return for their email email marketing is still hands down without a doubt the best way to market your book you know so if you've only got one thing that you, you want to think about in terms of marketing and um, it should be email and i would say from the other perspective as well if you're not if you don't not set up for email marketing you're crazy you that is the one thing yeah. you, you, it doesn't cost a lot and it really can return over and over again across the years yeah. yeah i mean i always think that if you're an author and you have an author page and someone signs up for your newsletter they're basically asking you to sell them your book when it comes out i Pretty mean much. that's what i'm saying you know my favorite authors i'm on their newsletters so that they can tell me when they have a new book so that i can go and buy it i mean because that's it's a win for me. I get to read what I want to read. It's a win for them. Absolutely. Email, email is, and yeah. I think we're a little shy about that as authors. I think a big part yeah. of why people don't set up for email marketing or they do set up and have everything absolutely gorgeous and, and totally in place and then don't send any emails. Yeah. Um, and that's far more common than you would believe. You know, they don't send a newsletter. They don't send, and they don't even want to tell their people. I don't want to tell, I don't want to come off as salesy, Sorry, you know, yeah. and definitely I think it's a confidence thing where you've got to realize they, they want to hear, they like what you're doing. It's strange and startling and surprising as it might be, they yeah. actually do want to hear from you. So building up that relationship, I speak as somebody who, who really had to learn how to do that. It takes a bit of time because what you're talking about is a relationship. It's a relationship between you and your reader. It can't just be about, you know, you have to buy my book when it comes out. Of course not. It's, it's, it's a two-way relationship. But and like any relationship, it takes development. It takes time. If you, if you email between books and you have a warm relationship around a, a shared interest or the setting of your books or, um, you know, thriller writing in general or whatever it might be, uh, then when it comes to the time to actually buy, you're just, your book will sell itself if your list is big enough. And mm -hmm. you'll also get, you know, they will go out and review your book for you. They'll go out and tell other people that your book is, 
exist. So email marketing is the one to focus on, uh, definitely for everybody. And, and it then, is, as yeah. writers, you do have this skill, compared to people selling other products, writers have the ability to write something that's going to be useful for their community. So if you have a short story or if you have something like that, that you, that you can create that's in your wheelhouse already and then give it away for free in exchange for people signing up for your email list, I mean, that's something kind of magic that writers have that most people who are trying to sell something don't in the same way. That is so true. And I'm really glad you raised it because I hear a lot of people saying, I love writing, but I hate marketing. And that, you know, that just breaks my heart because marketing is writing. Actually, mm -hmm. it is crafting great emails. It is even crafting great ads, great social media updates. These yeah. days, uh, marketing has become writing and it wasn't like that before uh, you know that wasn't how it worked before at all this is a really unique opportunity for you every time you put something out there at a marketing level to reproduce your mission as a writer your you know what it is you're trying to get across in your book you can get across also in your ad uh, or in your email and newsletter to your fans or whatever so it's about thinking of all of these activities not as opposed to the writing on the contrary having to craft a good sorry it's, a, it's an extension of your writing it's a way it's com to completely integrated with it having to craft a good email to your your list you know to your your people when you have to think about what would they actually like and um, to hear from me when you actually have to go in and do that and solve that question that feeds back into whatever it is you're writing now and you know how you think about that book and it can feed back into plots even and into structure and stuff so you know creating that relationship having that direct feedback from pe real live people it's it's invaluable yeah yeah i agree okay where are we at and just to say one thing about promotion, which we kind of, I kind of did consider, consider the two of them together again for, for um, time reasons. I really urge you to separate them in your mind, but I, I kind of treated them slightly together just because we, we just have an hour. But just to say this about promotion, think in terms of campaign-based publishing. So once a quarter, have some kind of promotional thing that you're doing for one of your books, whatever it might be just set something up and give it a go, something that appeals to you. And as Lisa said, there's a hundred thousand ways you can promote a book. There really, there really are so many ways. What you've got to do is find the way that fits in A, with obviously most important, your target readership, but B, equally important, your working week. You've got to, you've got to keep on writing at the same time as you're promoting. So it has to be something that you like doing that provides a nice kind of counterpoint to your writing. And that's why blogging doesn't work for a lot of writers because the last thing they want to do when they finished producing the words for their book is turn around and write a blog. That's why podcasting is becoming more popular among authors and videos. There's, you know, as I said, there are countless ways to do it, but the point is for you to find out the thing that suits your target market and suits you and your writing and life routine so that you're not, you know, one of these indies that works 18 hours a day, seven days a week and yeah. no longer knows your own name. And yeah. it's, it's got to fit into, and it, again, I'm always talking about time and the things take time in publishing and they do. Again, it takes time for you to find the things that, at work I'm still learning though I've been publishing my own work now for seven eight years and I'm still this year I really feel certain things clicked for me that really there's no way to know what I know now without having gone through at least some of that time and making some of those mistakes so think in terms of a, a promotional campaign once a quarter put a few um, and some money again behind it if you can definitely put time and energy behind it the act of thinking about that campaign is going to again focus your mind about who is your target reader, about you know what is what you are writing, why you write, what your writing is for. All don't think of it as a waste of time. Think about it as a fully integrated step in the whole process, the whole overall process. Yeah, well, and I think thinking about it for me, thinking about things in terms of promotion, where I just you know make 
a to-do list of these are the 10 things that I'm going to do for this promotion and then I can tick it off and then I'm done compared to marketing, which is always sort of a million things that you can do. It feels, it feels a bit more doable, a bit more, and more like great little bite-sized things. Than and that. more satisfactory. You know, you yeah. can actually say that job's done, whereas marketing yeah. is like, you know, just personal hygiene. It's never, <laughs> you always have to have another shower tomorrow. You know? yeah, yeah, it never um, ends. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So and we're okay for questions on marketing and promotion. Everybody knows exactly how to market and promote themselves from now Well, on. there's a, there's quite a few questions there. Um, let's see. For, I mean, there's some really practical ones. Um, for email marketing, do you prefer double or single opt-in? Oh, double, one double or the opt-in other? always. Single opt-in is a very bad idea because you get a lot of bots and they're not really readers at all. And you don't, you want that second, you know, I, I hear a lot of authors thinking, I, you know, I build a bigger list without the double opt-in. That is absolutely true. But if somebody can't go to the effort of clicking the, um, you know, clicking the, the click that they have to do in your email, really, they're not going to be an engaged reader. You're better off not having them on your list. You want your list to be engaged. So definitely always double opt-in. Okay, cool. Um, uh, Grace wants to know if it's if you think it's worth engaging a consultant to help you navigate the self-publishing route. Um, yes, but not until you've done some work yourself to understand where you're falling down. So, you know, a consultant is generally paid by coming in and telling you kind of what to do and how to do it and so on. And they can, they will be able to pick out all sorts of things and they'll bring their opinions and they'll bring their, the way they think about publishing and all of that into it. In order to have a proper conversation, proper professional conversation with them as an equal, you need to understand yourself. So if you're trying to hand off the job, then um, of thinking and the emotional labor, not just the intellectual labor, but also the emotional labor of, you know, what it is to be an author publisher. You are both and what it is to be in business as a writer, what it is to run a creative business, what it is to know your niche target audience, you know, all of that work, nobody can do that for you. So again, you know, with a consultant of that nature and a marketer, you know, I see, I see indie authors hiring people to market their books when they haven't done the work that they need mm -hmm. to do in order to properly hire a marketer. So until mm -hmm. you've tried to do it and learned what you learn from trying the process, don't hire somebody. Don't hire anybody until you're really, really crystal clear what you want from them, how you'll know whether they've hit the target or not. This is an area where you can spend so much money to no avail. Mm -hmm. So you really yeah, do need yeah. to be cautious um, in, in marketing and promotion in particular. I can't think of any other job where you can kind of say, okay, here's my fee, pay me now. And if I get no results, well, that's kind of, I'm sorry. I'm just going over here to market somebody else's book, you know, and that's doing a great disservice to some of the fantastic marketers that there are out there. But there are a lot of marketeers in this arena who they don't need you to ever sell a book for them to make a living. So you really do need to understand what you're doing um, before you, you hire expertise in that way. That's really good advice. Really good advice for probably all sorts of uh, parts of life generally. The, more, the better you know, the better you'll be able to hire someone to do something. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, let, why don't we go through and we'll come back to some of the questions once we see how much time we've got at the end. Okay, sound? so the final, the final thing then is, is rights licensing. And so what this is, is people think of publishing, as I said at the beginning, as you know, a publisher saying, yeah, your book is good enough, we're going to publish it. And what happened under that arrangement was publishers generally would look to take as many rights as they possibly could world rights for as long a term as they possibly could for as many territories and in as many formats as they could and most authors if they didn't have an agent not being professionals would just sign the dotted line so they would essentially exclusively give over all rights to one publisher what an indie author does is it doesn't mean that you'll never work with trade publishers again on the contrary if you start doing a good job as a publisher trade publishers will come looking and um, overseas rights buyers but also local digital publishers and all sorts of people will want to work with you and so what you need to work with is what we at Ally we call a selective rights licensing so 
you decide i yes i'd love to work with you for my say my north american print rights because i know you can take my book into bookstores and my print on demand model doesn't really do that very well you can do that better but it's only in north america and you know our arrangement is based accordingly i'm going to give my uk print rights to a to a uk publisher and i'm going to actually keep pod for china because i do better on pod there or whatever and the idea being selective rights you limit the term which is the amount of time that you're giving over the rights for you limit the format you only sell one format to one rights buyer at a time unless they're paying for the um the other ones and they and crucially they have a plan to exploit them because what happens is the publisher is always looking to hoover up the rights or the rights buyer to the you know a tv producer film and it's mm -hmm. the same in every walk of rights buying their job as they see it is get as many rights as I possibly can because I never know which one is going to take off and I can't know in advance. So I want to get as many as I can for as long as I can. And your job is to give as few as you can for as short a period as you can. And it's, it's, a, it's negotiating that. So understanding selective rights licensing is important for an indie author when you get to a certain level of success. This is not something you need to think about if you're at the beginning, if you're on your first book or anything like that. This doesn't really arise. It is the seventh stage of the publishing process. Even in trade publishing, people don't fully understand rights. The rights department is down a corridor. It's kind of like, mm. what goes on, on down there? I have no idea. And it's a little bit separate. And it can seem, at, you know, if you're at the early point of your, of your writing development, your publishing development, you might be thinking, oh, that's just pie in the sky. It will never apply. But if you have some success, it will apply pretty quickly. So you do need to, to think about it and understand that. So as a general principle, non-exclusivity, limiting term, limiting um, territory, just principles to carry around with you when you're talking to anybody um, who's offering you a service or a publishing or a rights deal of any kind. Okay. You've got lots of information about this kind of thing um, on the Alliance website, don't you? Yes, we do. And we also have a dedicated literary agent who works with um, our members who have got to a certain level of sales and he can actually negotiate and do some, you know, do some actual representation if people need it. But we could also have all sorts of setups that encourage people to do their own right selling as well and, um, and reaching out to rights buyers and so on. Again, it's something that you don't have to think about at the early stages, but yeah, the information's all there. But it's good to have it there. Actually, before we, we're starting to run a bit out of time. Do you want to just tell everybody quickly a bit more about the Alliance in case it's anything that anybody, um, sure. something that they might be looking for? Yeah, so the Alliance of Independent Authors is a non-profit association for self-publishing um, authors. And we have three um, levels of author membership. Um, our associate members are people who are preparing to publish a book. Um, our author members have published um, at least one title and are actively working at becoming, um, you know, people who are self-sustaining indie authors who will actually, you know, make their living from writing and publishing. And then our entrepreneur members are those who have sold more than 50,000 books in the last two years or equivalent. So, okay. um, yeah, so we welcome people at every stage and all over the world. Our head office is in London because that's just where we live. But actually, like Pro Writing Aid, we're completely global and we have members everywhere. And um, most of our members are in North America, uh, either Canada, Australia, like those two, or Canada and um, the USA taken together is our biggest bulk of members. But we have lots here in Europe too and all over the world. And uh, yeah, we're not just about offering features and services so discounts and information, downloadable books and um, you know, all sorts of benefits and features, but we're also about representing indie authors in the wider publishing sphere, in the creative industries. So we have links into in seven territories around the world, we have links into the publishing industries there and trying to get um, a more equitable playing field for indies where we can, you know, be represented at, at literary festivals in the big book prizes, 
in other associations you know it's it's really unfair how indie authors are treated still in loads of ways so we're always kind of banging that drum as well so we're we have definitely have an advocacy and a campaigning role as well as our um, benefits for our members yeah i really recommend everybody go and have a look at it it's kind of an amazing community i first met orna at the london book fair and her the, the stand there just had a constant stream of indie authors going in and out and meeting each other and it was, it was really, it was a really nice place to be. Um, and then Orna, do you also want to um, tell us about the book? Oh yeah, so all of this, <laughs> <laughs> the book. Oh, this one's been for ages coming. So um, this is essentially all I know about self-publishing in between two covers. And it's, it's based around the seven processes of publishing is kind of right in the heart of the book. So I go into all, everything we've been talking about today in, in much more detail and recommendations and why and so on. But it's also, it's called creative self-publishing. So it's very much about, this is what I feel is a little bit missing in the indie community at the moment. We hear a lot and, you know, there's no shortage of advice in the community. We're giving advice tonight and there's advice all the time. Sometimes it's hard to know what's good advice and what's not. I think it, a lot of Indies do find their way around that. But I think what happens is we're too inclined to do what other people are doing. And we don't realize just how kaleidoscopic and creative and how many options and opportunities we have. Or if we do realize that we're actually kind of uh, rabbits you know, in the headlights is that yeah. you were talking about earlier. That's too, much. <laughs> too much, don't know what to do, completely overwhelming, I have to clue, I don't know. So the key to getting that right, the other thing is that, you know, it's so compelling and so interesting and so fabulous that you can actually ruin your life and just be doing nothing but publishing tasks from morning to night, ignoring your family and um, having no friends and just, you know, locking yourself into it because it really can be very consuming so yeah, the key because it never ends it yeah. never ends it never ends and the mountain of work is always there you know you're you're not just needing to be a great writer which is a whole big skill set and then you need to be a great publisher which is a whole different set of, of, of things completely and then you need to bring those two together in a meaningful way that works for you and you want it to be sustainable and you want it to be scalable you want it to grow over time and you want it to be for the long term not just a one spike book and then gone again which is is very disheartening and is kind of how the old model works for most people so there's a huge amount to kind of uh, find your way through and the key to that is your own creative compulsions your own creative impulses and your own creative capacity and your your own uh, processes how you work as and your practices that keep you in the creative zone so you don't go kind of crazy in the head and um, so create your own personal creativity is key and I just feel that we're not talking enough about that in the community in relation to publishing we talk about right. creative creative writing all the time but publishing mm. is also a creative skill it's a set of seven different creative skills as we've seen tonight yeah. Yeah. so bringing your own creativity into each of those not only makes it more enjoyable it definitely yeah. makes you more productive and it also makes you more effective so that's what the book is about really it's full of exercises and questions that you open up your mindset get you thinking in different ways make you go deep into your own personal motives and intentions why you're right why are you doing this crazy job in the first place and um, you know all those yeah. kind of, all those kinds of questions so it's taken a long time to condense it all down into um, 80,000 words. So it comes out in September, and um, but there is a pre-order page um, up now, and I have the first, um, it's with the editor at the moment, so the, the first uh, preview copies will be coming out in July. So if anybody is interested and would like to pre-order, um, you can do that on orneros.com forward slash creative self pub. Okay, we've just dropped the link there. Um, and so I think people are clicking through. So um, if you've learned something today, let us know in the chat. And I think that's great. You know, as a marketer, as a writer and a marketer, there's so much creativity in marketing if you're not afraid of it, if you, if you find the things that work for you and, and avoid the things that you dread. It's quite yes. fun. It's good. Absolutely. You're singing my song. It totally is. And I speak as somebody who was 
petrified <laughs> of the word, never mind the actual work. Just the word was enough to make me go, oh God, no, that's not mm. me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a writer, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've learned a lot in order to, to kind of come around to understanding just how creative marketing can be. Great. All right, good. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for your time, Orna. Thank you, um, Lisa. Thanks everyone. All right, good. Hopefully we'll see everybody back here on, in one of our next sessions. Take care and have a good day. Bye. Good night.